Good morning, everyone. I am so grateful to be a part of this and so glad that you're here. I am Cheryl Smith. I am a member of the Black Farming Conference Committee. And I just want to say as an elder and a veteran of the struggle, it is so rewarding to see a new generation, not just picking up the gauntlet, but carrying it forward. And I want each of you to know that you are treasured and cherished by the elders and by the ancestors. So I have a double privilege this morning. I get to introduce the most requested speaker for the conference and an amazing person that I have come to know through her book and found her incredible. Um, Leah Penniman is a Black Creole farmer, Piazon mother, soul, soil nerd, author, and food justice activist from Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York. She co-founded Soul Fire Farm in 2010 with the mission to end racism in the food system and reclaim our ancestral connection to the land. As co-director and farm manager, Leah is part of a team that facilitates powerful food sovereignty programs, including farmer training for black and brown people, subsidized farm food distribution program for communities living under food apartheid and domestic and international organizing toward e equity in the food system. Leah, ha Leah has been farming since 1996, holds an MA in science education and a BA in environmental science and international development from Clark University, and is a manye, and I hope I said that right, queen mother in Budan. Leah trained at Many Hands Organic Farm, Farm School MA, and internationally with farmers in Ghana, Haiti and Mexico. She also served as a high school biology and environmental science teacher for 17 years. The work of Leah and Soul Fire Farm has been recognized by the Soros Racial Justice Fellowship, Fulbright Program, Pritzker Environmental Genius Award, GRITS 50, and James Beard Leadership Award, among others. Her book, Farming Wild Black, Soul Fire Farms Practical Guide to Liberation on the Land is a love song for the land and her people. And she sings it very well. So I'd like to present Miss Leah Penniman. Thank you so much, Elder Smith. And thank you so much um, to this whole beautiful Black farming community in Dayton and beyond. Um, it's an honor to follow uh, my elder mentor and dear friend, Baba Malik Yakini, um, thank you so much for that beautiful address. Um, I always am taking notes while you speak. Um, so thank you for that. And it's an honor to be with you all this morning. I am really excited to share some remarks that center Black agrarian genius and also weave in the work of Soul Fire Farm and some of the ways that we're working to uh, collectively overcome the barriers to our food sovereignty, as Baba Malik so eloquently des described as distinct from our simply our food security. Um, so I'm going ahead, going to go ahead and share the screen. Hopefully, this all technology agrees with us today. All right, so here we are. Uh, I want to begin, of course, by. Uh, building on what Baba Malik and others have done in terms of calling in our ancestors. And today, I am feeling inspired to particularly call in my maternal grandmother in blessed memory, Brown Lee McCullough, who's the baby in the picture there uh, with her parents, one of 10. And grandmommy helped me fall in love with growing food. She had a garden in her Boston area home, inspired by her childhood in and around Rock Hill, South Carolina, where she grew strawberries and a crab apple tree. And together we would make jam from these wonderful fruits. And, and I continue to be a fruit grower, very much inspired by that time. 
So I want to invite you in this moment to think of a familiar or ancestor who has inspired your love of land and food yes. and write their name in the chat so that we can also call them in and celebrate them. Uh, so go ahead and do that now. Bring them into the space, an ancestor or family member who has helped you understand that you're connected to food and to land. I also want to um, give homage and thanks to the original people of the lands that we are on. Um, we are on the lands of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of the Mohican Nation. And these are unceded territories. The Mohican Nation, most of its citizens were forcibly removed in the 1800s to Northern Wisconsin to a pretty desolate and remote area uh, that does not match the natural resources of their homelands. And over the past several years, we have tried with humility uh, and grace to build a friendship of solidarity with citizens of the Mohican Nation. And that's looked like rematriating certain seeds, uh, the Mohican black corn and the number six bee bomb, which uh, were gifted to us. It's also looked like working on pipeline campaigns to disrupt E37 that would have desecrated their homelands on Pascany Island. That was a successful campaign. And it's looked like granting a cultural respect easement, which is a piece of paper that guarantees uh, citizens of the nation perpetual access to the lands here. They, even if a future owner comes, they could not deny the Mohican nation access to the lands. And we continue to listen to uh, what citizens are asking for and to try to be in, in relationship to those requests. Because even as Soul Fire Farm is a black and brown led uh, community farm, we're not Mohican. And so we need to have that uh, humility that comes with settler privilege. And I also want to, of course, um, as Baba Malik did, uh, thank my team members. There's nothing that I'm doing by myself. There's nothing Soul Fire Farm is doing by ourselves. Um, and really want to thank Kiani and Naima and Jonah and Kai, Brooke, Cheryl, Azare, um, all members of our team for the amazing, hard, dedicated, heart-centered work all the time towards our collective liberation um, that has made possible uh, uh, through, that, through that commitment. And so before I get too much into this beautiful story of Black agrarian genius, I want to say just a few words about Soul Fire Farm and what our work is and how we came to care about the things that I'm about to share. Um, our our uh, refrain, you know, our mantra, our meditation at Soul Fire Farm is to free ourselves, we must feed ourselves, seeing very much that um, opposite in some ways to what Henry Kissinger talked about when you control the oil, when you, you control the nations, when you control the food, you control the people. Um, how true that is, right? In pandemic, when especially when you see uh, the, the desperation with which we approach the empty grocery store shelves, that truly we are in the grips of a system uh, that controls our food. And so to get free, we have to have the means of production in our, in our own communities. So what that's looked like at Soul Fire Farm is, first of all, we are uh, just celebrated our 11th birthday. Uh, though the groundwork for Soul Fire Farm started 16 years ago uh, when my family wed ourselves to these 80 mountainous acres in upstate New York, about three and a half hours north of New York City, near Albany, um, and started to collaborate with the land, which at the time was heavily degraded and eroded. There was no infrastructure for human habitat. <clears throat> the you know, agricultural experts that we had come look at the land said, there's no way you can grow food on this land. And so it was many years of investment before we actually opened the farm in 2010. But you can see here, you know, this is a typical weekly uh, solidarity share uh, that our community members would receive during this time in the season with eggplant, squash, tomatoes, peppers, kale, greens, beans, herbs, melons, uh, leeks, garlic, and so on. And we grow all of this food using Afro-Indigenous methods that actually sequester carbon, increase biodiversity, heal the land. Um, and over time, I've been able to increase the quantity and quality of what we can give back to, to community. And all of this food that we grow is distributed through a no-cost doorstep delivery system. Um, that is called Solidarity Shares. And many of our members have been with us you know, since the beginning. It's the very first program we ever started. In fact, Soul Fire Farm was an idea generated by our uh, neighbors living in the South End of Albany when we were all struggling with food apartheid. 
um, that insidious system of segregation that means that our neighborhood had a McDonald's and a liquor store, but did not have a grocery store or a farmer's market, um, predominantly black neighborhood. So they said, you know, you all know how to farm. When are you going to start the farm for the people? And so Solidarity Shares was the very first program that we created and, and the one, the longest standing. This is my uh, son, Emmett, who is now quite a bit taller, <laughs> uh, showing, showing off the Solidarity Share box in front of the, the van. Um, so after, you know, a couple of years of distributing food to community, we started to get some phone calls um, of people saying that they wanted to learn how to grow food and medicine uh, from black and brown folks, you know, in a place that's culturally relevant. And this, this surprised me, honestly, because I had believed the myth that black people weren't interested in farming anymore, that the oppressions of chattel slavery were so overwhelming that we had left the land behind. And if I wanted to be a farmer in some ways, I would, was gonna be a traitor to my people and have to just do my own thing in the woods. So when these calls started coming in, um, we did our best to respond. We created uh, youth programming. We created uh, day-long workshops. We created season-long apprenticeships, week-long immersions, a 50-hour course, which turns out to be our flagship program, the FIRE Farming in Relationship with Earth Immersion that teaches everything from soil to stomach of how to grow um, and share food. Um, we started a, a, you know, a fellowship program recently called Braiding Seeds that provides a salary to uh, the sort of 10, 10 promising uh, black and brown farmers each year, along with a mentor and professional development. And, you know, of course, infused into these programs is joy, um, is culture, is history. You know, it's not an accident that these farmers look incredibly fly and fresh and fabulous while they're hanging onions in the barn, because that's just how we do. So in our programs, you will experience um, the fashion, the singing, the dancing, the ritual, the storytelling, uh, the ancestor reverence, all of these very important aspects of what it is to be uh, black and people of the global majority uh, are not separate from what it is to care for the land. And while we are rural, and I'll say that again, because people always think that if you're brown, you're automatically urban, we are a rural farm. And we do also very much support um, urban growers. And so we are about uh, 35 minutes from the city of Albany, 20 minutes from the small city of Troy, New York, and have an urban gardening program where we create uh, in collaboration with families, churches, and schools, these garden boxes, uh, raised bed gardens where soil and uh, uh, we provide soil, plant seeds, uh, monthly courses, opportunities for getting together and you know, sharing the harvest and sharing knowledge with one another. And then the, you know, third and final kind of layer of our work. So there's the farm, there's the education, right? And then there's the organizing and, and mobilizing, you know, be, because we'll get, we'll get to this soon. And, and Bob and Leek talked on this quite a bit, but there are systems of oppression that make it very difficult to be a person in relationship with land that's not exploitative. So, we get together with the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, with the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, with the Heal Food Alliance, to try to change policies, to try to build sane institutions um, that provide capital or that um, food hubs that you know aggregate produce or land trusts that go ahead and give land back um, to indigenous communities and others who are dispossessed. And this organizing extends internationally. We're members of Via Campesina, and we work very closely with our sibling farms in. Haiti, Mexico, Ghana, Vieques, uh, to, to work together towards a collective vision of food sovereignty. This is a seed keeping co-op um, in Haiti, which is my maternal homeland. We've been working there since the 2010 earthquake uh, with some mango, peanut and vegetable farmers. And that has looked like solidarity brigades where we would go each year you know, with skilled volunteers to go support some of their projects and also do fundraising. Uh, to infuse their projects with necessary resources. So I want to talk just a little bit now that you have, you know, been introduced to Soul Fire Farm and hopefully feel and experience some of the passion that drives our work to understand what is the foundations of that. Um, because we do have, we do have a beautiful, bold agrarian history. And I will tell you that when I started farming back in 96, uh, I would go to, you know, all the farming conferences that I knew about in the area, the Northeast, 
Organic Farmers Association and so forth. And the presenters were white, they were largely men. The authors of the books on the tables were white, large, you know, majority men. And so I didn't understand that what we were doing was not uh, adopting a European framework when we got into farming, but really doing a, re a remembering. And so I wanna go all the way back um, to what is depicted in this painting. This, this painting is called Foresight. It's by my woman soul sister, Naima Peniman, and it shows the sacred moment when our ancestral grandmothers decided to braid seeds into their hair, knowing that they would be forced onto transatlantic slave ships. When they gathered up their gourd, their sorrel, their basil, their black rice, their cola, their melon, black eyed pea, their sesame, their cotton, right? And put it into their hair as insurance for an uncertain future. And this is the legacy that we hope um, that we carry forward. Um, but the thing is that along with the seed, our ancestors brought with them a whole lot of brilliance in terms of how do we grow food in a way that's in right relationship with the earth and in right relationship with human community. And that's what we're about to dive into. But before we do, um, I want to turn the question to you. And I realize not everyone may have um, chat, so I'm, I'm going to, you do have the Q&A box, <laughs> maybe you can share in there. But I'm curious. What are the practices you use in your farm or garden that come from come through this African legacy? For example, is there a way that you test your soil that is black agrarianism? Is there uh, certain crops you grow that come from a black tradition, African tradition? Is the way you prepare your beds uh, for growing, uh, the financing for your farm, the tools you use? So take a moment to think about how you farm. And if you want to write down somewhere or say out loud or tell the person next to you um, an example of that, I would very much appreciate that. So I'll pause now and listen to whatever you want to put forth. Oh, great. You can write in the chat. <laughs> That's good because it's funny to just talk to a you know a screen. So I, I like to have some interaction. So please do uh, write write in the chat. What are your um, practices that you use from the Black agrarian tradition on your farm or in your garden? And there's no right or wrong answer, by the way. So don't be shy. Shall we read some of the answers coming in the Q&A for folks? Sure. So we have land ownership, seed saving, beginning our season on the spring equinox, using no-till, companion planting, always okra and black-eyed peas, preparing beds, composting, preserving the harvest. Hi, Erin. <laughs> Three sisters. Um, ask the soil what she needs to move away from nitrogen, um, growing herbs for medicines, using available materials, layered gardens with natural composting, livestock at the center, and I'll just read off two more, and, but you can keep them coming, fermenting produce, and thanking the sun, beautiful. All right, so y'all got this, you just like, you don't even need me, but um, I'm going to go ahead and go through some of these uh, practices and it might spark some additional ideas. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is soil testing and point out that in my left hand is the soil that we encountered when we first wed ourselves to this land back in 2007. Um, and in my right hand is the soil we have now. And we were able to go from this hard pan subsoil as topsoil clay that was impenetrable to a shovel, uh, very low in fertility, uh, low acidity, you know, to this rich, dark humus that produces so beautifully using these Afro-Indigenous techniques that we're going to talk about. And, and one of them is soil testing. Um, I don't know if any of you on your farm have ever done texture by feel, where you uh, pick up some soil, you put, a, put it into a ball or a ribbon, feel it and you can tell if how much clay is in it or how much sand is, is in it. Well, that comes from the Europe of people, this idea of texture by feel. And in fact, across uh, sub-Saharan Africa, we have many of these 
tactile methods for testing soil, including using color gradation, including um, using uh, taste. So actually being able to determine pH by how sour or how sweet the soil tastes. And that's something that I have not perfected, but I have been trying to learn uh, because it's so powerful to me. And of course, Western soil scientists roll in later and say, oh my goodness, look at how these indigenous people have figured out how to very accurately classify their soils. It matches our, our, our classifications. Um, but if anyone has ever picked up soil to determine its clay or sand content, that is a Yoruba um, technology. Uh, I'm, I imagine many of you compost, you know, we certainly do. You see these uh, children having fun with some earthworms. So the first documented uh, intentional composter um, in human history is Cleopatra, uh, 59 BCE, you know, during her reign, she had a whole cadre of priests whose full-time work was dedicated to the study of earthworms. And there was capital punishment for hurting an earthworm. And you know, while I certainly don't support the idea of the state executing its citizens, it's very powerful that Cleopatra and that community recognized how important earthworms are to generating uh, soil fertility. And if you take a soil core, as scientists did in the 1940s, you can see that the earthworm castings during the time of uh, her rule were much higher than the surrounding area or the surrounding time periods, demonstrating how effective um, her campaigns were um, around using the vermicomposting. Another kind of composting that's become very popular is when we talk about biochar or terra preta. And um, Black folks have our version of this. It's called African Dark Earth. Women in Ghana and Liberia uh, uh, created this technology that combines ash from the cooking fire um, together with bone char and uh, soap residues from making soap and from the kitchen. And this special pyrogenic compost is super high in carbon, super high in nutrients, um, you know, and used to obviously enhance the fertility of the farm. But perhaps most astounding is that there's such a strong environmental ethic around everyone participating in the creation of this dark earth that you can actually take a uh, soil core and measure the age of communities by the depth uh, of this special compost because you can count on the fact that everyone has contributed a certain amount. So that's pretty powerful. Um, I'm gonna ask folks to write in the chat again, curious if when you see this picture, uh, what type of farming you think it might connect to? Give you a second to, to guess at that. Someone said meat farming, slash and burn. I just made it so attendees can talk to everyone too, because I think it's helpful for everyone to see each other's answers. Great, wonderful. So, um, so I, I studied environmental science uh, uh, as an undergrad and saw a picture like this in my freshman, you know, 101 class. And yes, they told me it was slash and burn. And along with that was this sort of su subtle anti-indigenous uh, message that somehow, you know, brown folks can't figure out how to manage the environment is, is what came through. What I learned later on is that slash and burn is a derogatory term for what we know as Swidden agriculture. And Swidden agriculture is the first ever crop rotation with fallow. The way it works is that a forest um, is cleared using fire, a uh, certain area of the, the forest, and that fire releases nutrients. And then people grow in, the nutrient, in that nutrient-rich uh, forest floor for a couple of years. And after the soil is tired out, they move to a new area. Now, the, what makes it Swidden agriculture is that the cycle is a generation long. So we're talking about 20 to 30 years before the farmer or the community would come back to that original spot. And of course, by then, an entire forest has re regrown. And forest is the ultimate cover crop because it captures huge amounts of carbon below ground. Um, it's able, because of the, the root depth, to actually pull minerals up from the subsoil to bring them up to the top. Uh, in contrast to some of our one-year cover crops, which are still important, but not nearly the same as a forest. And this system is very sustainable. It sequesters more carbon than it puts off. Um, it maintains habitat. It maintains uh, biodiversity corridors. The, the, the trick is colonization. So when, when uh, colonizers come and steal the land from indigenous people and push them into smaller and smaller areas, that cycle that was once 20 to 30 years becomes 10, then five, then three, then two, 
and that's no longer sustainable because the forest cannot regrow. Um, but the the original, the OGs, right, of of uh, rotational or crop rotation uh, with cover cropping and fallow, uh, of course, are Afro-Indigenous farmers. So I want to uh, take a moment on permaculture here. <laughs> so. And, and no shade on the permaculturists that all of them are, are really good friends of mine, Pandora Thomas and Earthseed and all of that. But, you know, permaculture is a term that is was coined by uh, white college educated men to smash together without credit indigenous practices from around the world. And one of these practices, probably the most common and celebrated is, is perennial polyculture, the idea of taking plants that grow back year after year, like trees and shrubs and medicinal herbs and planting them together in an ecosystem that mimics the forest. So there's different levels, you know, the tall trees and the medium sized shrubs and the herbaceous layer, maybe vining crops um, and, and in a way that's mutually supporting. So for example, at our farm, you know, our apple trees are surrounded by chives, which repel pests and bee balm, which attracts pollinators and comfrey, which provides a mineral rich uh, mulch uh, when you knock it down. So all that to say, you know, this idea of perennial polyculture is another Afro-Indigenous technology. Um, in among the Yoruba people alone, we know of over 30 uh, perennial polyculture combinations that are commonly practiced. This picture is of a nursery in Haiti. Um, in Haiti, they call that system Jardin la Cou, which means house garden. So a Jardin la Cou would have uh, moringa trees, lime trees, mango trees, um, acacia, growing together with shrubs, cactus, uh, vetiver grass, grosso grass, um, as well as uh, vegetables and then goats and chickens running around. And this nursery is one that, that our comrades in Haiti uh, worked on as part of a, a reforestation project. Another uh, very related Afro-Indigenous technology is fanyaju, which means throw it upward from Kenya. These are terraces, as you can see, this is a sloped area at Soul Fire Farm and on a slope, it's, it's very helpful to build these staircases or terraces that slow down erosion, uh, trap the topsoil and make it possible to, you know, for people who are used to working on a flatter area, you know, to tend to harvest. And it is Fanyaju, which means throw it upwards, is a really clever name uh, from Kiswahili because on a slope, of course, over time, the soil washes down to the bottom of the hill. So you scoop it up from the bottom, you throw it back up, and then you hold it in place with these retaining walls, in our case, made of uh, logs that we pulled out from the forest, which temporarily hold the soil until the roots of those trees are, are established. Um, so anyone who's using uh, terraces, you know, you can thank farmers of Kenya who actually developed this technology around the same time as, as farmers in Central America. Transplanting. Uh, you all live in a relatively cold, or many of you live in a relatively cold climate. We certainly do. We're in the mountains of upstate New York. So uh, our growing season can be as short as under five months uh, of frost-free weather, which means if we want to grow a lot of the crops that we enjoy, like tomatoes and okra and, and peppers and eggplant, you know, we need to start them in a warmer place and then transplant them outside. And of course, transplanting has the additional benefit of, you know, when the seedlings are grown together in a nursery setting, they can get a lot of extra TLC. You can really pay attention to how much water they have access to, the sunlight, the wind, you know, baby and protect them before they go out into the, the wide world, you know, of, of the garden bed. And so transplanting, some of the earliest transplanters were actually the rice farmers and Baba Malik uh, talked briefly about the, the rice farmers, but the Walla, the Mende, other folks in Senegambia uh, would you know, um, start these nurseries of, of rice seedlings. And then once they grew to size, go ahead and transplant them out into the patties and brought this, this technology of rice transplanting with them in the bowels of slave ships. And uh, those technologies became the basis for the multi-trillion dollar uh, Carolina rice industry during and after chattel slavery, the time of chattel slavery. Livestock. So, so much to say about livestock, you know, of course, uh, many types of rotational grazing, we can credit to Afro indigenous farmers rotational grazing is when you um, fence in your livestock and move them from place to place so that they have a chance to uh, eat 
you know, different parts of, of the vegetation, but also to deposit their manure. Um, but what I want to focus on today is, is actually poultry. The oldest domesticated fowl that we know about um, is, the, is the guinea fowl, and, and we found evidence going back tens of thousands of years of, of human beings um, domesticating and working with the guinea fowl. And a cousin of the guinea fowl is the, the chicken. And one of the reasons that black farmers have innovated so much around the, the chicken is because, you know, it's a little insidious, but, you know, in Virginia, um, during and after slavery, there were laws that prevented black people from owning livestock. And so these laws would list out cows and pigs and uh, sheep and goats, but they thought chickens too nominal to mention. And so because folks were allowed then to raise chickens became um, really expert at chicken breeding, developing different forms of housing. So, you know, if a lot of the, the varieties of chickens that we raise and the methods that we use to care for chickens come out of the Black American um, community in the South. So this one's really important, uh, especially for urban farmers, because you know, oftentimes our soil is challenged. And so we need to build some raised beds. You know, on my farm, we build raised beds because we have uh, heavy clay soils that hold water. And we also have an overabundance of of water and the, the raised beds help to channelize that and, and get it to infiltrate better. Uh, but we can thank the Obambo people of Namibia for creating this idea of raised beds and both rectilinear ones, as well as these type of yam mounds. And these yam mounds have a neem branch on top of each one, which is a deterrent for nematodes to infest the yam mounds, which is both brilliant and beautiful. Has anyone here ever, uh, attended or held a work party, volunteer day, mutual aid, brigade, anything like that? Yes, some people say yes, some people say no, I'm glad you can see. So this is something that we love to do for sure on our farm. We have community work and learn days and we try to show up for other people's as well. Um, and ours are, are less formal than, than this OG idea, but I wanna, I wanna shout out and uplift the idea of a dokwe, uh, D-O-K-P-W-E, uh, which is a Dahomey term, or a kombit, uh, K-O-N-B-I-T, uh, which is a Haitian Creole term. And it refers to a mutual aid or work brigade. And you know, I, it's sometimes hard for us to imagine like a world outside of capitalism, but for most of human history, we actually did not have wage labor. So the whole idea where you're, um, sort of contracting your time to an employer in exchange for, for wages, uh, which is the dominant system now of how labor gets done has, has not been the case for most of human history. Um, and one of the ways that we arranged to share our labor with each other was through these mutual aid societies. Um, and, and they're strict. I mean, you're a member of one, right? And that means that when it's time to go to, you know, farmer Samuel's farm to plant beans, like you're gonna show up. And then when it's time to go to Farmer Maria's farm to plant beans the next week, you show up and then the third week it's your turn and so on and so forth. And whoever is hosting these uh, mutual aid work parties would provide the food, they would provide some sort of um, entertainment. And in the case of an especially grueling task like cutting sugar cane or hoeing, uh, you know, primary tillage, hoeing a brand new bed, there would actually be live music. So they bring a brass band in Haiti to help the work go more smoothly and just rotate through you know, throughout the season because so many tasks on the farm, as you know, require uh, many hands to make the work light. Um, so, so we can thank um, black farmers for our systems of, of sharing of mutual labor. Does anyone here use a credit union for their banking? Curious about that. I know we do, we use a credit union because we like that idea of, um, you know, the, the, the members owning the bank, so to speak. So the, the idea for credit unions actually also come from, from black women. Um, you may have heard of Susus in the Caribbean, but they have precursors across West Africa. So it's a lending society where folks um, are again, are members. So there's rules, it's not just whatever, um, strict rules. And so you're part of it. And every week or every month, depending on the rules of your Susu, you're gonna be putting money into uh, the collective pot. And a trusted elder woman in the community is given the title Susuma, and she's the one who holds the money. And then when it's your turn to take out your loan um, or take out your uh, grant essentially from the Susu, you would get that doled out to you so that you can buy the new uh, roof for your market stall or get the 
uniforms that you need for your children to, to go to school, buy a piece of land, and so on and so forth. But this idea of a member-owned financial institution um, comes out of Black women's financial organizing. Many of the tools that we use uh, were invented by um, African people and people of the African diaspora. Um, everything from the refrigerated truck to the sprinkler. But I'll mention my favorite one, even though it's uh, more basic, which is the hoe, um, the long handled hoe, which is a most universal tool in farming. You can use it to plant, to harvest, to till, to weed, to dig, to uh, remove mulch. So if you only have one tool on your farm, it's probably the hoe. And, you know, I prefer the, the Haitian ones. They're like the big clunky ones and have been stopped more than once through the airport uh, on my way home for having oddly sized, oddly shaped and very heavy, sharp luggage. But uh, fortunately, have been able to get a few of those home. Someone mentioned fermentation, um, and I'm glad you did. Uh, any guesses how old that tomato is that this person is holding um, in their hand here? Go ahead and take a guess in the chat. Any guesses? How old is the tomato? <clears throat> a few weeks old, maybe a week, a year. Nice. <laughs> so I know my tomatoes, I mean, this is tomato harvesting season for us. So if I leave them out, they probably last a week at the, the most, like a nice ripe tomato. So this tomato is six months old. And the reason it still is fresh and firm, which you just have to trust, you know, because, you know, we can't touch it, is, is because it was stored in a, a lined pit in the ground that was filled with ash. Um, so this is a, a way that uh, produce is preserved in Burundi. But so many of the ways that we preserve um, produce and meats and grains, such as fermentation, salting, um, root cellaring, drying, you know, come out of Afro-Indigenous wisdom. And fermentation is an especially powerful one. I know uh, it's very popular, you know, in the US and in Europe to ferment things like cabbage to make sauerkraut or, or kimchi. But remember that, you know, across Africa, people are also fermenting grains. So your, your kenke and your banku, um, you know, fermented maize or fermented millet dishes that, that preserve all of our foods and also increase the nutritional value and digestibility of our foods. Um, if anyone has ever made a call to your extension agent or, ag, you know, your ag agent, um, you can thank uh, the, the Tuskegee University or Tuskegee Institute later became university um, and their agricultural school on wheels. And so the first ever extension agents um, came out of this black university because, of course, they realized that so many farmers in the rural areas could not afford to come attend some lecture at some distant university about the latest in um, agricultural techniques. And so the school had to go to them. So originally all they had was a mule and a cart. And um, Thomas Campbell writes a beautiful memoir about this if you're interested in some of this black agricultural history, um, the movable schoolhouse. I'll, I'll get the full title for you right in the chat in a minute, but um, Thomas Campbell was one of the first extension agents uh, for, in the black community and in, in the community at large. So anyway, they would get a mule in a cart and they would go out to the, the rural counties and find like the most busted farm, you know, like sick animals and broken fences and trees that were diseased and they fix it all up. They plant cover crops, they would nurse those animals back to health. And that would then become the, uh, like the model or demonstration farm for the other farmers in the area to come and see. And then they go to the next county and repeat that same process over again. It was like extreme farm makeover, uh, <laughs> you know, in the late 18 and, and early 1900s. Very powerful. So that became the foundation of the extension system. And of course, we've already uh, shouted out the patron state, uh, patron state of agriculture, Dr. George Washington Carver. But I mean, there's so many things to say about him, but I've been really touched recently by um, reading a memoir called The Man Who Talks with Flowers about Dr. Carver and understanding that that he got up at 4 a.m. you know, every morning and went out to the forest to hear the voice of God and believe that God spoke to him through the flowers, through the trees, through the wind, 
um, that nature was this universal broadcasting station for the voice of the divine. And so his instructions about how to farm actually came from that. He believed that he was putting forth how God wanted us to farm. And that was in a way that actually centered the soil and cared for the soil. This was a time when monocropping of cotton and tobacco was pervasive. The soils were getting more and more depleted each year. You could see pretty quickly that there would be um, that natural resource base would be destroyed. And so he said, we need to stop that. We need to plant leguminous cover crops and, and legumes like peanuts and, and cow peas actually um, pull nitrogen down from the atmosphere and into the soil in collaboration with a bacteria. And, and those cover crops he popularized and justified them, you know, one, by, by showing what kind of products people could make from peanuts. So that's why he's famous for the peanut that it wouldn't be wasted space, but, but also quoting Bible verses, you know, whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me, and that refers to the soil. Um, so uh, we consider Dr. George Washington Carver, uh, the grandfather of regenerative and organic agriculture and the, in the modern times, and really the reason why so many of us practice this soil care. If anyone here has ever um, heard of or participated in anything farm to table, um, you can thank Booker T. Watley, you know, he had this audacious idea back in the mid 1900s, his 40s and 50s, he was getting started, where he's like, you know, we, we probably would be able to make a living as farmers if we didn't do wholesale of one thing, but instead tapped into urban folks longing for the countryside by allowing them to be members of our farm. We can provide a weekly newsletter that updates them on what's happening on the farm. Once they're members, they can get wholesale prices to come to the farm and pick their own uh, vegetables and fruits. And people thought he was a little wild in that idea, like who's going to pay you to come do labor on your farm? That doesn't make sense. Um, but I will tell you that even though I grow my own apple trees, I still paid some outrageous amount of money to go pick apple trees, pick apples from someone else's tree um, and get my cider donuts and everything uh, just last weekend. So, you know, this concept of pick your own was really brilliant in this com concept of a subscription or a membership to a farm. And it's been the way that a lot of the small farms today are actually able to survive in the face of, you know, increasing industrialization of agriculture. Uh, Baba Malik mentioned Fannie Lou Hamer. I'll, I'll throw out another quote of hers. You know, she said, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, no one can push you around or tell you what to say or do. You know, so she was very, very instrumental in, um, the formation of land-based cooperatives, uh, particularly Freedom Farm, which was a safe haven for uh, sharecrop former sharecroppers who've been kicked off their land for the audacity of registering to vote, which is of course a, a civil right and a human right. And so Freedom Farm became a place where they could own the land collectively and have that uh, long-term land security. And you know, this of course is not new. I'm, I'm shouting out Mama Hamer as one example of black co-ops, but if you read Dubois' work in the early 1900s, you know, there was a proliferation of cooperatives. Um, if you go all the way back to 1865 and you look at um, what groups of Black clergy were saying about how to design reconstruction, they said, we feel it's very important that we obtain homes, owning our own shelters and the ground that we may raise fruit trees concerning which our children can say these are ours. Um, so this idea of land security um, over the long term um, and especially cooperative land security is, is very much part of the Black agrarian heritage. Food hubs. Um, this is uh, Dorothy and, and Philip Barker, who received an award recently for their pioneering role in food hubs. But um, a food hub, for those who are unfamiliar, is a, a really genius strategy because it allows small farmers that maybe just grow a little bit of a lot of things to put their product together so that they can reach a larger market. So, you know, so say I have 10 bushels of hot peppers and you have 20 you know, and Baba Malik has 20. And together, you know, we're able then to get into a market that will accept a minimum of 50 bushels of hot peppers as their order. And, and the very first food hubs were um, simply the sheds in the, the back of black churches where farmers would bring their extra produce, fill up the shed, and then the church would take a truck up to their sister congregation up south, you know, in Detroit or Dayton or Boston or Philadelphia. Um, and then that would be distributed from the church. And of course, this has been formalized over time, but we can, we can thank the black community for the idea of food hubs. We can also thank uh, the black community for the idea of uh, free breakfast and lunch in our schools. This is the Black Panther Party feeding 20,000 children every single day free breakfast. 
in Oakland and beyond, and really seeing the survival programs of meeting communities' basic needs as foundational to a political strategy. And that became uh, the inspiration to enact, you know, previously the, the free lunch program had been on paper, you know, but had not been enacted in force um, until this model was generated. Uh, if any of you all have ever heard of a land trust before, the land trusts are highly popular ways of holding land in common um, in a way that really challenges private ownership and creates permanent protection. The first ever community land trust was created by black farmers in 1969 called New Communities Inc. They recently celebrated their 50th anniversary. We had the pleasure of attending before uh, COVID shut the world down. Now, Albany, Georgia, almost 6,000 acres of land collectively stewarded by, stewarded by 500 black families who had a farm uh, where they were distributing uh, produce. They had a market, small businesses. Um, to learn, I'm not going to go into detail about this history, but if you have not seen the documentary, The Arc of Justice about new communities, it's worth seeing because the full force of, of white supremacy came down on them for the audacity to try to get free and their story of uh, restarting and picking back up and carrying on it is very, very powerful. So I'll just mention a couple of more um, examples. And, and this one is very personal to me because um, at the time that our daughter Nishima was born, she's now 18, we were doing urban farming in the city of Worcester, Massachusetts, and didn't know a lot about uh, lead and arsenic in the soil, to be honest. We just assumed that if there is a garden area, that it's going to be a safe area. Uh, but it turned out when we took our infant child to her doctor's appointment that she had elevated lead. She had blood lead poisoning from the soil. And, you know, as parents, of course, we were very concerned and did everything that we could to get her uh, blood lead levels down and to, um, you know, do neuro, neurological repair. And she's wonderful, uh, healthy. But we didn't want to stop there because as community activists, what about everybody else's children? And so we started uh, an organization, uh, the Worcester Roots Project later became the Toxic Soil Busters, where we did soil testing around the city of Worcester. And, and while the Environmental Protection Agency will identify the safe lead level as below 400 parts per million, we were finding levels as high as 11,000 parts per million, uh, which is so toxic that it would be classified as a super fun site um, by the federal government. So we started doing uh, remediation of soils. And, and you know, again, that's the how you do that it, it is beyond the scope of this talk. I can certainly send some resources later. But one of the amazing things uh, which connects to black agrarian tradition is our biggest ally in cleaning the soil is a little flower called the pelargonium or the scented geranium, which is an African flower um, that came with our ancestors. And this African flower happens to be a hyper accumulator of lead. So it will take the lead, it will sacrifice itself, take the lead up into its body so that that uh, plant along with the lead can be removed from the soil. Um, and so I like to think of, of our ancestors in this flower having the foresight to know that black children would need it one day to help clean the soil. And, you know, the last thing I'll mention is our spiritual technologies. So when I was living in Ghana, West Africa, where I, I, I lived for, um, five and a half months and then have been back several times, actually in 2020, right before the pandemic for most recently, you know, I studied with the queen mothers who are incredible. I mean, they're spiritual activists, they're guardians of the environment, they care for orphans, they um, mediate conflicts, they run, you know, rituals. But they said to me when I, I was there, they said, you know, Leah, is it true that um, in the United States, many farmers will put a seed in the ground and they, they won't pray or dance or sing um, or pour libation or even say, thank you to the earth. And then they expect um, the seed to grow. And when I admitted that that was true, you know, with some shame, I said, that's why you're all sick. Right? You're all sick because you treat the earth as a commodity and not as the living, breathing relative um, that she is. And so we, we try to then um, incorporate these aspects, these elements of, of song and dance and prayer and, and life um, honoring, honoring of the earth, you know, into our work as well. And so I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to get to the bad news, which is probably good. But, I, you know, I just want to say that, you know, it is, it is not us alone that is, that's doing this work, 
you know, there are so many brilliant um, black leaders in the food system who are making sure that we're carrying on those seeds that were braided into our ancestors hair and Baba Malik is among them, you know, Mama Karen Washington, Dennis Derrick, Javana Johnson, Gail Myers, and so many others. And, you know, I won't speak to this just because of time, but do want to say that, you know, there are societal conditions that are preventing the flourishing of Black agrarianism that we do need to address. We need to address the gross um, disparities of land ownership, um, the fact that 98% of the land is white owned. We need to address the exploitation of labor. You know, almost all farm labor is people of color who are not protected equally under the law um, and who are subject to uh, wage theft and, and workplace violence. We need to address um, the fact that industrial agriculture is destroying the planet. You know, that it is, it's a leading cause of, of water withdrawals, of, of habitat destruction, of um, one of the leading causes of climate climate change and that you know the the te techniques and technologies are either appropriated or minimalized that I talked about when actually we need to center them as the genius that will save us. We need to address food apartheid where folks of color are disproportionately impacted by food scarcity and diet related illnesses, um, diabetes, kidney failure, heart disease. And finally and, and most importantly internally to our community is we need to address the trauma that we've inherited from land-based oppression that makes us think we're separate from the earth, makes us think we don't deserve um, healthy, nutrient-dense, culturally appropriate foods, makes us not recognize our own genius. And so there's, there's also quite a bit of healing um, to do. And so, you know, as we go forward um, from this moment, I think that, that it's really important to remember, and Baba Malik talked about this too, that whatever the, the solutions are that we lean into, we have to make sure that we center the genius, the leadership, the power of people most impacted um, by these issues, which means black people working in the food system, indigenous people working in the food system. So whatever those solutions, you know, it's about giving time and money and lands and platform and power over to um, organizations that are led by the people um, most impacted, organizations like SAFON, like Via Campesina, like the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, like the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, like Malcolm X Grass Move, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, Heal Food Alliance, and others. Um, so, what I'll leave you with, and if you could um, write in the chat for a moment, um, I am curious: what seed are you planting? So, after you've heard uh, uh, Baba Malik and I speak, um, and, and we are going to have some dialogue shortly, but what is the seed that you hope to plant going forward? And if you could take a moment and write that in the chat and, um, and then I'll just share a poem uh, with you to close. So go ahead and share that now. Have youth gardening and co-ops, tomatoes, okra. Oh, good. These are now going to everyone. Being inspired. Green beans, corn, okra, empowerment. Seeds of unity. So um, I'll leave you with uh, one of my favorite poems by um, Spanish poet Pablo Neruda, who said, pardon me if when I want to tell the story of my life, it's the land I talk about. This is the land. It grows in your blood and you grow. If it dies in your blood, you die out. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it.